Hey everybody, Chris here. I am at Heatcraft Refrigeration Products in Stone Mountain, Georgia. I'm about to sit down with a senior technical trainer and we're going to discuss how we can become better technicians and more informed about Heatcraft's refrigeration products. All right, I'm here with Don today. Yeah, Don Fort, senior technical trainer for Heatcraft Refrigeration Products. And as a senior technical trainer, what does that entail? What does that job entail? Well, training. One thing we saw early on, uh, pre-pandemic, well, we saw more and more HVAC technicians coming to refrigeration classes. Makes sense. Yeah. And so uh, helping them to get a grasp of what's different, what's the same, and what's different. It's a, it's, a, it's a learning experience, but it's something that we want to try to help people with as much as we can. You know, I get a lot of people that, that will ask me, you know, how do I transition to refrigeration? And they've been experienced HVAC technicians. And a lot of the times I tell them, you know, there's not huge differences. Really, it's the temperature of the refrigerant and sometimes the controls that we have to deal. Yeah. And there may be a few extra valves. I mean, especially if you're in the light commercial yeah. commercial sector, you get into the supermarket side and yeah, you're gonna add a lot of other components, but the concepts are still the same. Yeah. It's still a refrigeration cycle. Yeah. You're still transferring heat. That's right. That's the basic principle. That's it, that's it. So, and then, and then attention to detail because some people, they might want to cut corners from time to time. And we want to stress that with refrigeration, what with anything, three things, clean, dry, tight systems, right? Yep. And that goes whether you're working on an air conditioner or refrigeration system. But when we have this, especially moving refrigerated at, at refrigerant at, uh, at high velocities, at lower pressures, yes. then those are things that you have to really pay attention to. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. Right? Yeah, and when we talk about um, evacuation levels and different things like that, while they're all critical, moisture is bad for a system, but the moisture issues yes. become amplified the lower the temperatures get. That's right. Right? right. Yeah. yeah. Comfort cooling, 40 degree coil. Yep. As opposed to 10 below zero, 20 below zero in some cases for refrigeration systems. So, hey, it, to your point, it does amplify the fact that you need to do a good job of deaquivating a system, keeping it nice and clean so it works properly. Right? And as we lower the temperature in the system, if you have moisture because you did not do a proper evacuation, you run the risk of that moisture actually freezing within the system mm -hmm. the colder the temperatures get. Now there's other ramifications of having moisture in a system such as copper plating which can lead to premature compressor failure. Right. There's all sorts of other things like that, yeah. but in general, it's just heat transfer. We're That's just it. moving heat. That's it. That's right? it. But we add some other components. Now, here at Heatcraft, I've worked with your products for a while, and you guys have some new innovations, and you have new technologies, such as uh, the Beacon system, such as the QRC system, and the yeah. new system, the Intelligence system. Intelligent, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to these systems, uh, I mean, I don't mean to be blunt here, but what's the point of your job? What are you training people for? Well, it, it's, it, it's interesting you say that because one thing is energy savings, Got right? It. Because, okay, if, if I can, as opposed to a Paragon timer, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defrost four times a day, whether I need it or not, right? right? Which, is, which, yeah. is, which has worked, and yeah. it's worked for many yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. But, but if I have the opportunity to, to save money, because I can maintain coil efficiency yep. at about 80%, well, why wouldn't I want to do that? So with electronic controls, that gives you, it opens up a vista. With mechanical, just not, uh, just, just not efficient enough. But with electronic controls, now I have the opportunity to, okay, so let's take tabs, because now I've got a transducer and a thermistor yep. working together, right? So I, it, it'll know, starting from its reference point, when we start losing efficiency, because now my delta T is getting closer and closer yep. together, right? See, so now, uh, when it gets there, I can do a demand defrost, or I can do a, what we call a smart defrost, only doing looking at certain times during that, that, during that refrigeration period to see, well, am I still within 80% efficiency? If so, I can skip a defrost, right? So the money I would spend on low temperature to turn on that, that cow rod heater, guess what? That goes away, right? So, so I could go 17, 18, sometimes almost 20 hours before I have to really before I have to really defrost that system, right? right. Yeah, so, and, so. and with your guys' control system then, you guys are able with your sensor placements and stuff uh, then to identify when you might have frost on the coil? That's right, that's right, because it's, it, it knows where it started because if you have a, a normally operating system, it's gonna know, well, 
temperature is going to change because that's the relationship between my, my calculated temperature pressure relationship right. and the actual temperature with that thermistor being measured. So looking at those two values, it can tell, okay, so these are, they're moving away or closer together. Do that, well, what made that change? Well, it, it, it's because I'm not able to properly load that coil, right? Yeah. Because I've got frost on it now. I'm not moving heat thrust through those coil plates, right? See, so, hey, it may, but to answer that question, uh, we have to teach the sequence of operation. Well, why does it do what it does? What can I expect? You've got, you've got, to, you've got to be taught that. You're not going to walk up to it and find out what that sequence is, right? You've got to, you know, you've, you've got to actually be taught that. So we do teach that, you know, and and trying to keep it as common sense as we possibly can step by step through the sequence of operation because if you don't know how it's supposed to work, how can you troubleshoot? You, you, you right. can't, right? No, yeah. and it's, I would imagine, uh, I know this to be true, as you get into more high efficiency systems, as you get into intelligent, to a controller that has logic built in, you know, while it seems easy, and while it actually is rather easy to set up, there's also complexities to it yes. that we need to understand as contractors. Yes, yes, yes. and that's, that's totally true. And so, so how do you, how do you logically troubleshoot to see if a thermistor is still valid? Is it still good? Is it still sound? Transducers, we use a three wire, a capacitive type of pressure transducer. Right? Cause so, so how do you do those things and make sure that it's monitoring as it should? And even from an installation perspective, how can I make sure that I don't ruin that in some in some way just by the virtue of me installing it incorrectly? So oh, that goes, you're, yeah. you're leading me to the, the, the topic <laughs> that I brought you up earlier, right? So I was doing an installation uh, and I did not read the installation operation manual and I was doing a nitrogen pressure test on a system and I pressurized the system. I didn't have any leaks, so we were good. I did my okay. job right, right? Yeah. But then when I started the system up, I started to notice the system acting a little funny. It was flooding back to my compressor and I'm starting to think, what did I do wrong? What happened here? And I'm gonna tell you that my logic, because it was new and everything, I was like, this is just not working right. This system is just, <laughs> it's instant for me to go to that, that mode, like this is their fault, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, in their defense, there was a big sticker on the pressure transducer that says do not pressurize at that time over 150 PSI. Uh -huh. And I think I pushed it to 200, 250 PSI because I was going to find out if I had any leaks, right? Yeah, yeah. And I ruined a pressure transducer, right? Just popped it, right? Had I read the installation operation manual, I would have known that. Okay, so I'm guilty just like many other people of jumping into it and trying to be a cowboy and I could do this. And you know, I've learned that there's a lot of things we have to follow installation instructions. Especially if you've been doing this a while, you yes. just make an assumption. This is just like the last one I worked on, which is not all, all, the, all together true, exactly. right? See, so, hey, just make sure. All right, this is strange because I'm not seeing anything wrong. So if I go to, let's start back at the beginning, to superheat, where that's cooling mode, 42 degrees in the box. My superheat currently right now is five degrees. Uh, see, yeah, we're running kind of low right now. Okay, so it's, a minute ago it was at 15. Um, suction pressure. Ah, it is not 77 PSI suction pressure. Yeah, that is a problem. 51 PSI and the unit says 73 PSI. So there's something wrong with that transducer. For your information, there is a Schrader port underneath the pressure transducer. And uh, pulled it off and it kind of makes me wonder, I can't remember what I pressure tested to. I wonder if I got the pressure too high on this. Because it actually tells you right here, do not exceed 150 PSI. I can't remember what te what pressure I pressure tested to. You know, so I can't overemphasize the fact that, we, hey, read the book. It was made by the manufacturer. They, they should know how their equipment works and just do that. There's a reason why it's there. There's a reason why it's there. So right? when it comes to training, um, what kind of training do you guys offer? We do, we really offer core training. For example, basic refrigeration and installation. What do you need to think about and do? What are considerations that need to be top of mind to get a system up and running? Mm -hmm. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, right down to actually, we do like in, in the uh, refrigeration basics class, there's a whole activity about, okay, so how do I select my, my liquid line? 
what size did my suction line need to be? And what about my riser? And, and how do I construct how do I construct that P-trap? You know, at, at, the, at the head of that riser. You know, so all those things we go through, and even the no-no. So there's a reason. There's a good way to do that successfully, and there's an unacceptable way to do that. So, so then you yeah. guys are being proactive and going beyond just training on the specifics on your products, and you guys are even doing kind of introductory training to basic yeah. refrigeration. Yeah. I imagine that you guys have realized the value in that. Yeah, because as you know, piping is key because it's all about the pump. Yep. You know, I've got oil in that pump because I have moving parts that need to be protected. If they're not, it's gonna seize up, I'm gonna have problems because without that pump, all I have is a very expensive refrigeration bottle at that point. Right? I can remember, you know, coming up in the trade and um, I don't remember how many years ago it was that I learned that just because your off the shelf condensing unit has a three quarter and a three eighths suction line on it, doesn't necessarily mean that that's what the line size needs to be from point A to point B. And I can remember the question yeah. in my head in my infancy was, well, if the evaporator has a bigger suction line and the condensing unit has a smaller one, which one do I choose? Because yeah. I thought, hey, we just pick one or the other. <laughs> when in fact, the answer is, it's not necessarily either one of those, and it depends on the line set length, right? the total equivalent length, which yes. is factoring in all the turns, the bins, the restrictions. Right. And inevitably, it's leading down to proper refrigerant velocity and proper oil return. That's right. That's right. Good point there, Chris, because not only that, but what refrigerant am I using? And then Good what's point. my TD? Okay, so is my target temperature going to be 20 below zero, 10 below zero? All those factor in, and again, that's why we crack the book open, because there are tables to refer to that's right. based upon capacity of the system, is it a 12,000 BTU, is it a 24,000 BTU system? Okay, so now comparing that to, well, what is my target temperature going to be? And so when I, make, when I bring those, those values together and to, to make the crosshairs, there is my answer. So I've got that half inch liquid line. I've got, I've got that inch and three eight suction line, you know, for that 24,000 BTU system. Okay, yep. so, so uh, you gotta know that. You just can't guess or pick because all those things can change based upon my TD. Okay. And I would say that especially now with all the new technology, with, with all the energy efficiency, we have to go back to the basics and we have to follow proper installation practices because with new mandates and new regulations, mm -hmm. we're dropping condensing temperatures, we're doing all sorts of things to maintain yeah. energy efficiency yeah. and to get better numbers, right? But our system design becomes more and more critical, even more so than it did in the past. I remember yeah. coming up in the trade and you know, it's, it's a funny term, but I was taught beer can cold. You charge to a certain pressure and that suction line just needed to be cold on air conditioning systems. Yeah, and uh, the old you know, eight sear days, six sear days, In my right? head, six. I try thinking, why did it work back then? You know, and it's like, well, because that equipment was forgiving. You had a massively oversized condenser. Yes. They weren't so concerned with efficiency, but the more efficient our systems get, the more important it becomes to understand the refrigeration yes. process and what's happening in the system. And that's critical. And so, so it's so important for us to be mindful of the fact between air conditioning and refrigeration, because refrigeration, okay, so you and I could be maybe not so comfortable in the space, but now if I'm trying to hold product, well, that, that ice cream's got to be five below zero regardless of ambient, right, right? right? So it doesn't matter whether it's 100 degrees outside or whether it's minus 10 outside, I've got to have a steady state operating temperature in the box, what's holding that. So to do that, well, how do you do that? Well, refrigeration temperatures and pressures are directly proportional, right? Yep. If temp goes up, pressure's got to go with, up with it. Temp goes down, pressure's got to go down too. So knowing that in cold conditions, I've got to have a way to artificially inflate my, my head pressure, right? That's right. To, to, to make sure that I have 100% liquid going to my, my expansion device, right? But even with that, there's industry changes coming out, right? Because yes. the old way was just to maintain a constant pressure. We need 180 PSI yeah. or 70, 80 degree liquid temp, right? Uh -huh. Everything is designed at that same thing, but even that is changing right now. When it, it comes is. to efficiency, it we're using a term floating the head pressure down, but we're essentially reducing the liquid temperature, right? Yes. Making the system more efficient because lower the head pressure, lower the liquid temperature, less watts that the compressor is going to use. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. So 
But when we do that, especially on legacy systems, we have a problem. Because if our head pressure is going lower, your expansion valve is sized for a certain liquid temperature. And That's again, right. like you said, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the pressure and the temperature is proportional. That's they right. react together. That's right. So as we drop the pressure, as we drop the liquid temperature, yeah. things start happening in our evaporator and your expansion valve can now potentially be oversized, undersized, depending on the, the, the conditions. Right, and so how do you safeguard against that? So now you have to have, that's why we have head pressure controls, because now we're going to have to hold back some of that liquid at that condenser outlet yep. to, to now take up more space in the condenser. When that happens, guess what? Less space, I'm going to artificially raise the pressure of that condenser. Now I have something usable. Now I have something usable that goes down in that liquid receiver on its way to the expansion device, right? Regardless of ambient, to kind of be a safeguard. So when one holds it back, that's what you want. But see, understanding that from a air conditioning perspective, move, moving to, to refrigeration is key, is key. So you may see a single head pressure control, or you may see a dual ORI and ORD valves, right? Yep. So, so, so do I have those two working in tandem? They work the same. It's just one gives you more latitude because based upon fluctuating ambient conditions, because we don't know where this equipment is going to go. It could be north of the Mason-Dixon line or south, you know. So based upon those things, that's going to really give me guidance as to how I'm going to set my system up, right? And I'd say too, again, as with energy regulations, AWEF compliance and different things, yes. every manufacturer out there that I've dealt with on refrigeration side, in one way or another, they're dropping the condensing temperature of the system. They're dropping the refrigerant temperature, yeah. whether it be head pressure control valves, fan cycling, either way. And with that being said, let's go back to what we started talking about in the beginning is proper system design. Yes. If you're in, doing retrofit installs, if you used an existing liquid line that maybe was already oversized, right? And you know, you now have too big of a liquid line that will hold too much of that liquid refrigerant when maybe there's not enough liquid refrigerant to flood the condenser anymore. Yeah, so that's yeah. where proper sizing really comes in. It and we're going to segue that back with reading the installation operation manuals. When yeah. we learn about line sizing, when we learn about yeah. how the And that's part operates. of the training too. And I will say it, to that point too, we have a fine tool that, uh, that can help guide someone so, so the refrigeration toolkit, you can actually build a heat craft system. And then within that, then that's an app on your phone. You can, well, does this need to be a, 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 a with compliant or not? Yes or no? Oh, okay. And it, it walks you through that so you can actually build. So if it's a whole system or you, are you just looking for an evaporator or a condenser to replace for a system, you can walk through that just right in your phone to do that. So, and that'll, that'll spit out, now it'll give you typically more than one system as, as a sample, okay? So AWIF compliant and non-AWIF compliant because sometimes outside, uh, outside the realm of uh, if it's over 3,000 square feet for your box, okay? So that's, you don't have to be AWIF comp uh, compliant. But uh, if you are, well now, now you have some options, heat craft options that actually can, you can then, once you, when you finish the calculation, guess what? You can actually email that to a customer, email it to yourself, you know, you've got that, or even even if you've got a wholesaler you deal with, okay, so that goes to, now, oh, here, here's my, here's my model numbers, I've got a compliant system now, you know, so uh, we try to make that as easy as possible, but, al but also we want to expose technicians to, to that as a tool that can be used to help them deal with what they're facing in the field better. better. All right, so when you talk about wholesalers, okay, do you guys train the wholesalers too? That is always an option. Okay. In fact, like for, and we'll talk about Heatcraft Certified Contractors in a, in a, in a few moments yeah. there, but they have the option to actually host training. They will come out gotcha. and do training. So they don't have to, you don't have to just come to Stone Mountain, we'd love to have you, right? Yeah. <laughs> to, to, to be trained, but also our wholesale distributors can also host any of our training. You know? So that's interesting. Uh, as a contractor, as a technician, then we could, potentially petition our wholesalers and ask them, hey, I'd really like to get some heat craft training. And yeah. then maybe that could start the conversation right. to get them. So what I find is that there's a lot of misinformation out there with wholesalers too. Um, you know, I've heard, I'm not going to name names, but I've heard some horror stories of, of people doing certain things and not understanding proper system operation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, we can definitely 
somehow get these wholesalers trained that way they can go back to the old industry standard of being the people that trained people yes. you know and and yeah. and sadly yeah. it's kind of gotten a little ways away from that but yeah. you know it'd be nice and, to get and, them trained and, a little bit more and, and there's some wholesalers that are more proact proactive in that regard than others of course you know but we want to put that as an option to them. So our sales staff, they're in, they all have, have, have trade areas that they work with. So that's, their, that's part of their job is working with those wholesalers to make sure that they know their options and to help them get better. They'll go in and do lunch and learns with them, but also they can also put before them the fact that, uh, well, you know, you can have some training you can host here for technicians if they want to get, like for basic refrigeration, uh, we, we also uh, do intelligent control uh, training. We also do uh, even uh, CO2 transcritical training, you know, for that, you know. So, so that's, those are all options there that, that are on the plate that will help people in the field get more comfortable with what's coming in, in the future, right? So you mentioned about becoming a heat craft certified contractor. Kind of enlighten me on that. What's the process and what is that? What benefits do I have for becoming a heat craft certified contractor? There are a lot of neat benefits to that. One, it's uh, it's raising your comfort level, and okay. also also when when a customer, a potential customer, wants heat craft product, they can go on our website heatcraftrpd.com, look for the contractor locator. Well, if you're certified. Guess what? When they type in their zip code, they're going to have your name come up there. Boom. This is the Ecraft certified contract in your area. He's the expert. Call him. Got it. Call his company, right? That, but also the training itself, it's NATE certified. So if, if someone is looking for a CEUs to, to, to keep their NATE certification current, that, that will go toward that as well. Right. So they can go into their, their My NATE portal if they're already NATE certified. Type in that part number, I mean, that part, <laughs> our course number, and they can get credit for that. So, uh, uh, toward their NATE certification for the year. Because okay. I think every five years they have to have a certain amount of hours, you know, yeah. for that. You know, so, so that's also something. Also, once certified, they get a 30% discount on any, any training in the future that we, that we conduct. Oh, okay. So, that's 30% right off the top for yeah. them. So, part of the package that the HTCB uh, contractor gets once they get certified and get their certification number is we send them a starter kit okay. that's got uh, an IRC control board, that's got a transducer, got a thermistor, and an EEV. You know, so, so that's about whew, $900 worth of stuff right off the bat to kind of give them a, a nice start yeah. as, as they start to service the equipment. Not to mention that. When they get certified, every piece of equipment they put in that's heat craft, you know, that, that's a heat craft piece of equipment, they get an extra year of uh, warranty tacked on to, uh, to, their, to the, the standard warranty. So, oh, so, they, so that's a selling point for them to the right. customer. Yeah, to the like customer. Like if you use me for this installation, I will give you an I'm extra, a certified contractor, so. I'll give you an extra year of warranty. Oh, that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. For that. And, uh, and also when you think about, so, so you've got that, you've got, um, the 30% uh, discount on all training. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, being being listed as the expert in their trade area. So right. when it, it so and and the customer can can zero in on five miles, 15, 20, 25, 50 miles, that sort of thing like that. So within that range, so so that's a pull for you. So potentially you have some cold calls. People can call you up. Hey, I hear you're the expert on Hecraft. I've got this project for you. Can you do that for me? So so for that, and uh, just the, the fact that. Uh, that uh, um, they're comfortable and they are adept at not only installing but troubleshooting this equipment as well. Yeah. You know, you know, that I think that's a benefit because as a contractor myself, while I wouldn't necessarily send every one of my technicians right away, you could start you know, a lead technician can get certified and then you could slowly start sending everybody to get sure, certified. that's certainly you know? an option. It, it is, it is. In fact, we've had, uh, when they fill out the application, there's, there's a space for up to eight technicians. Got it. You know, you have, as long as they have five years experience in the field, yeah. that's fine. And we only require that one technician be Heatcraft certified contracted con uh, certified. If you have multiple offices, like some people have more than one, yeah. one shop, yeah. if you will. You know, so as long as you have one in, in that shop, then you still keep, can keep your certification rating for that, you know, so. So, okay, so that's interesting with the training. I have a question though, you know, when it comes to this EXV, why this EXV over a thermostatic expansion valve? They do the same thing. They Great. meet a refrigerant, 
right? But what's the point of having an electronically controlled valve versus a thermostatic valve? Great question, great question. You can put that back okay. up. I, I've got another one over here. Because I was hoping that you would say that. <laughs> <laughs> but part of the training too, especially on the basic refrigeration training, we run a graph that shows you the difference. Okay, so let's say you have a superheat and our target is 10 degrees, right? So from a cold stuff, from a fresh start for cooling, okay, you'll have a TXV and an EEV right. going. It will take, on the average, that TXV about 120 minutes to get anywhere close to 10 degrees superheat. So to stabilize right. out. To stabilize. As opposed to the EEV that after it gets to steady state, steady, steady state operation, that's about, well, about 15 minutes in, right? It's just hugging that 10 degrees the whole time. Bottom line, it's more efficient. So it, tighter temperature control. Yeah, you, you've got to have it. It's tighter temperature control. And now, because these are pressure controls, I mean, that's where some people get it. Well, uh, I'll just adjust my TXV to get my, my low side pressure down. No, 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 no. It, it's there to make sure that we don't, we don't have liquid on its way to that compressor, right? right. See, so because they're vapor pumps, they're not liquid pumps, that's right? That's right. And one thing about that, that we, we always try to give tidbits as to what a technician can do to make themselves more efficient in the field because it is about, okay, sequence of operation, where's the deviation, and how can, it, how can I make it right, uh -huh. okay, for that. But then once you do, what's going to help you get there? For example, if you're working on an EXV system, uh, on these, now these, we, we happen to have Corel valves for these, but now... That one that, you, that, we, that we send with the kit, guess what? Now, in the INO manual, if they read it, uh -huh. there's a way that they, can, that they can manually manipulate that valve to, right. to open and close the valve. And sometimes they might have to do that because if they're warning about a restriction, I, I, is that stem coming off the seat all the way, whatever, that sort of thing like that. Okay, how do I get, make sure in my mind that I can either eliminate at that as a pain point or not, right? right? So you can do that with that, or, or you can use, and we, we actually give these away in class, but you got to come to class to get one gotcha. <laughs> for, for Corel. So then that goes right on that valve. And you see, it's, it's a no-brainer because it tells me which way to turn this to close it and which way to turn it when, I'm, when I open it. So if I want to open this completely up, yeah. guess what? There you go. You hear you that? Hear it, yeah. And, and this is the this is really what's superior to, uh, as opposed to doing this manually. If this is all I got, that's all I got. Right. Okay. That that's it. However, if I do have the tool, I can tell quickly. Oh, I'm right I'm, I'm 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 right. I'm 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 I'm, I'm as open as it's going to get. Yeah. Right. So now that that removes all doubt as far as where that position of that particular stem is relative to the seat. Right? So that's a method of verification whether or not the valve is working properly. Sometimes we just need a mental verification. Is the board doing what it's supposed to be doing? The board says it's open this much, but is the valve really yeah. opening? We can kind of prove and, it. And that's the mechanics of it. Now, you, there are test modes that you can put in there to, to now check, because that's, that's, that's mechanically, but what about electrically, right? Yeah, See, so yeah. so there's, there's, there's a test mode you can put it in to, okay, so it's basically, it's basically a two coil valve. So I got uh, A, B, C, and D. So A to B, C to D. I mean, it's really straightforward because each, each, each one is going to be 150 ohms, yeah. thereabouts, right, for that, to see if I, so if it's within that realm, let's say within 10%, now I'm not, that's not going to be the culprit. But now if I'm measuring that and it's 50 ohms, well, I've probably got some shorted windings yeah, you got a stator inside that problem. head. That, yeah. the stator is, it, it's so, so that's that that's those are some of the things that we make sure that people understand, and and they have a good uh, they've got a good uh, bearing on on what what they're dealing with, what they're looking for. The other side on that because you heard the click when it's wide open. Well, what about when it's all the way closed? Because these do the 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 the, uh, the stem does have a spring. So when I close this thing all the way, look at that. It oh, backs up. Okay. So see, so now it's going to, because with a lot of EVs, and even on the, on the air conditioning side, you, power, you, 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 remove, you remove power, bring power back on, right? What happens? You, you always hear this It's over closing on purpose, just to make sure that it is closed on the seat. 
it'll do that several times. Gotcha. You, you do that, so, so okay. So for that, it's gotta have some kind of spring, otherwise you're gonna ruin the stem, right? It doesn't take that, that, that long before you kind of blunt that stem. It's not gonna hit, hit like it should. But see, that, it just gives you a little more flexibility as far as, am I troubleshooting this properly? And, and am I really verifying that this thing is physically, physically okay? Yeah. Right? One thing I have to say that I got to give you guys props for when it comes to your EEV systems, and, and it took me a while to finally read the manual and learn this, but is that you guys actually ship your systems with your valves in the open position. Mm -hmm. So when we're doing an installation, we can purge with nitrogen without having to do anything. And in fact, you don't turn on the power to the system and you install, you purge with nitrogen, you braze everything in, and then you start it up. And on startup, if you listen, you'll hear the valve close. Yes. So that was something that I, when I finally figured that out, it's like, oh, that makes sense, you know? Yeah. And that was a cool, and I, and I imagine had I gone to the contractor program, I probably could have known yeah, that. Yeah, you would have, by the time you got finished, you'd know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you'd know. Yeah, 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 for sure. So those are a lot of benefits uh, for that, especially as we get more specialized in everything. Uh, it's just one more feather to put in your cap for that in the customer's eyes. I mean, why do people get ADSC certified when they're a technician or, or mechanic, right? Because my potential customer recognizes that if you're trained like that, then I'm going to trust you to do my work for me, right? You see, otherwise, that level of trust is not there necessarily. Yeah, and right? I'd say if the manufacturer is willing to stand behind you, it's got to give confidence to the customer. Right, right. That's you know, the, other the, thing. the manufacturer is willing to say this guy went through a certified program. He did these steps. He went through this, and you know this particular person is capable of doing the installation of this equipment, of maintaining your equipment. Right, and and the, and the certification program it's a two it's a two day training. So so the first day we we give you a good look at the swath, the whole catalog of what we offer for in the field as far as selections of equipment. But not only just it's not like you're going to go like back there see. Back in the back, you might see there, uh, well, that's, that's what we call an LOP. It's got the intelligent control on it, mm -hmm. right? But uh, where's the low voltage on there? Where do I hook my high voltage there? You know, where do I, where, where do I, where do I, where do I put my, my, my liquid and suction line? Where, where are they going to? So all those chassis, we, we, we go through those during that day one process as far as it goes. Here's, here's what you can expect from this LOP or the medium profile or the large unit cooler. What's different about that? What are my options for that? So that's the first one. The, the second day is really intensive because that's where we get the intelligent controller and the sequence of operation for that controller. Gotcha. And it's hands-on. You're gonna have to actually wire the thing. You're gonna actually put it through, we do five, five activities that really help them to focus on, not just set up for the first time, right? Because you have to tell it, tell it what it is, but it doesn't know. So what refrigerant, well, if it's 449, okay, you gotta tell it that, you know? I, I, you gotta tell it whether it's gonna have a condensing unit connected to it, that's gonna be wired to it or not. Yeah, so you oh, gotta okay. tell it to, right? You gotta tell it all those things. And then once you do, now it knows where it's, what, what, to, what to do. Right. Now it knows what it's target, and also the set temperature. So what, what's my target temperature for this? Okay, so that's going to have everything to do with, well, what superheat value am I going to have to achieve and maintain depending on the refrigerant I've chosen for that system? Is it R404? So all, all the common refrigerants are right there. So during the setup process, we, we just tell it, and it reads off what it is. Okay, so okay, I'm going to find, oh, here's 449, 448. Okay, lock that in. Now, now it knows what it's dealing with, you know? So it, it's, like you mentioned, it's pretty straightforward, but it's just information you need to know so you don't stumble, right? Yeah, you know, and yeah. I've set up several intelligence and several QRC systems, and, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's a few questions that you answer, especially with intelligent. It's, you know, there's some real basic questions. Yeah. Like you said, you went through them, and then it does everything. It maps the system for you. It profiles the EEV operation, and, and you're That's off it. to the races. You That's know? it. Yeah, it is, literally. And you can do that in less than two minutes. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, a standard mechanical TXV system, guess what? It's going to take you a while. Yeah, it's going to take you a while. You're going to have to wait for it to stabilize. You're going to make adjustments. You're going to give it time. You're going to make another adjustment. Mm -hmm. You're going to give it time. Mm -hmm. And then maybe you're lucky and your system operation is good. Yeah. And, and, and about two hours later, you might be ready to go, right? Yep. So, so <laughs> as opposed to two minutes for setting this up, right? So, That's so right. 
Yeah, and time is money. Time is money. So yeah, that's another thing to be thinking about how to convert your mind to this electronic mindset because we're not going back the other way. We're not. I mean, with all the DOE mandates, and we're at 7.6 right now as far as AWIF is concerned. They're probably going to raise that value more as far as DOE. Now, that's not us, but we do have to comply to it. You know, we, sure. have, we have to build to it. So, uh, hey, it's not going to go away. So, I've got two choices. I can either embrace the change or retire. Hey, One and, or the other. And I agree. You yeah, know what? Yeah. We, have, we have a lot of people that don't want to evolve with the trade and the way things are going and you're going to get left behind. We yeah. need to embrace the change because as a manufacturer, as a contractor, as a technician, if we embrace it, then we move on with everything and we stay employed, we stay in business and, you know. Yeah, and one more thing about the, the uh, certification program, we, once, once they get certified, the clock starts ticking, right? Three years later because, hey, we're not going to stop building new stuff. So we want to make sure that they stay up on the new stuff. Right. So they're required to recertify, you know. Gotcha. So whatever it's going to take for that particular time, new chassis comes out, new, uh, new logic, whatever that sort of thing is, hey, we want them to be up to snuff on that. So we'll let them know when it's time for, for them to recertify. And that's, that's a good thing too, so to keep them current. Because as you know, even with doctors, I mean, you just think, somebody that, 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 that uh, became a doctor 25 years ago, if they never went to another seminar, if they never went to an, another workshop ever, at some point they're gonna be useless as a doctor. Right, there's always changes, yeah. you know, it's inevitable. Yeah. Right, so. Yeah, so, so that's, that's the same thing with us, because we are doctors of a sort, right? We are. All right, Don, this has been some great information. Where can people learn about becoming a Heatcraft Certified Contractor? Where can they go to find more information on this? Easy peasy, man. Just go to heatcraftrpd.com, hit the training tab, and then right there in the, in the upper left-hand corner, there's going to be, hey, do I want to be a certified contractor? Hit that bat button. Awesome. Boom. So that's on the training page. That's, it's got everything they need. Plus all the options as far as what we call, our calendar is live and up, so they can see, well, what other things can I get trained on? That's there too. All right, this has been great information, Don. And you know, again, heatcraftrpd.com, all the information we need. Thank you so very much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.